Good evening. First of all, thank you so much for coming. It, you know, a lot of times when we do planning things, maybe one or two people show up. Um, having this crowd is fantastic. Um, it just shows what a community we have here. Uh, my name is Shannon Haggett. I'm the chair. Yeah, free food, free food helps, absolutely. Uh, I'm the chair of the Planning Commission. Um, I'm going to pass the mic around and just introduce the other members of the uh, Planning Commission. We're going to then briefly go through a, a, just a real brief presentation that talks about what a municipal plan is. Then we'll do some breakouts um, and have some good conversations and then come reconvene and, and uh, recap. Uh, Mike Winslow, Vice Chair of the Planning Commission. Cheryl Brinkman, member. Uh, Tim Cook, member of the Planning Commission and also the Development Review Board. I'm Carrie McFarlane. I'm one of the newer members of the Planning Commission. I'm John Coburn. I'm just a member. <laughs> Danelle Byrong, one of the newer members as well of the Planning Commission. And, and way in the back, we have Christine Garrow, who is also on the Planning Commission. Thank you. So basically, this is what I just said we would be doing. Um, you know, so I'm going to skip this one. So a municipal plan, um, and, and if you look in the back, Christine, can you hold up a copy of the municipal plan? Thank you. It, it's, a, it's a living document that gets updated every eight years, sometimes more frequently, uh, and it, it really is a long-term guide for the city. It, it enables us to make our zoning regulations. Um, it helps us in getting grants. Um, there's a lot of good marketing information in there about the city. A lot of times real estate folks will use it to sell the city because it gives you a good sense of what's going on in the community, what our services are, fire, police, um, sewer, schools, all of that sort of thing. And why do we do this? Well, we do it because the state makes us do it, but it's also an important thing. Sorry about that. I'm winging it here a little bit. And as it says, you know, it, it helps us figure out where, where do we want to spend our resources to make things happen, whether it's a sidewalk extension or a new police station, things like that generate from the plan. Why is it necessary? It also gives us subdivision regulations, flood hazard, um, Having the plan affects whether state uh, Act 250 applications go through. Um, a lot of grants, we, we get a lot of grants here in the city of Virgins. Uh, a lot of the streetscape projects that have gone on are a direct result of projects that are called out in the plan. Um, there's a listing of them on that. Now, we can't just do the plan willy-nilly and say, oh, this is what we want to do. There are certain required elements, and there are about 14 or so really state-mandated elements, and I'm not going to bore you and, and go into the weeds on all of them. Uh, as you can see, here, here are, are most of them. Um, the land use plan is where the zoning regulations come out. Um, the energy plan is, is an important piece. Uh, the transportation plan is getting to be a more important piece. There's more, as you can see, there's quite a bit there. Flood resilience, especially with uh, a lot of the things that have been happening over the last 10 years, weather-wise, climate-wise, flood resilience is a very important piece. But what we're here for tonight are four main areas where we, the Planning Commission, have been focusing our efforts. And, and those basically deal with things in the high density residential district, whether 
whether we ought to change the density, meaning how, how tightly packed should houses be in that area. Um, the agricultural district, we don't have any active farms in the city limits anymore. Should we consider changing that agricultural district? What do we want to do in terms of accessibility and connectivity? Sidewalks, paths, recreational pieces like that. Um, and, and then the energy needs. Uh, you know, the, the state has some pretty aggressive goals for energy over the next 20, 30 years, and how can what we do meet those goals? And in addition, there's something uh, that Cheryl will talk about a lot more when we go over to the energy part. Um, if you have an enhanced energy plan, which is something that's only been around for about the last year in, in the state, in fact, uh, countywide, the regional energy plan just got adopted a month ago, uh, so it's pretty new. But if you have a, an enhanced energy plan, it gives you substantial deference in public service board, excuse me, public utility commission hearings as opposed to just regular person off the street. So that's an important thing for us to consider as well. In terms of the high density residential district, and again, Tim is gonna to talk to you much more about that at table one. We're looking at what exists now and what we're kind of proposing to make it maybe be a little more dense. Um, the reason that we're doing this, uh, there are a couple of things. There, there might be some opportunities for other state designation programs that we could go into. Um, you know, more development, more housing generally is not a bad thing to have in the city. Uh, it means your taxes might go down if there are more houses and the grand list gets bigger. Um, Tim will deal with that a little bit more. On the agricultural distri district, excuse me, um, again, you can see what is existing versus what we're proposing. Again, uh, with no working farms, maybe some of that land could be used more wisely as being developed as, as housing, not being as dense as, say, the historic neighborhood district or the medium density residential district, you know, where most of us live, but maybe uh, more houses there might not be a bad thing. Um, and that will be taking place over here at table two with Mike. Accessibility and connectivity, basically talking about walking and biking trails, safe sidewalks, uh, walkability within the half mile radius around the downtown. So we have the central dis business district where we are right now. And usually in state programs, if you're planning things, that half mile around that, that central core downtown is usually considered, that's the area that's walkable where you wanna have good sidewalks, where you wanna have uh, it really easy for people to come and go using people power as opposed to vehicles. And, and so we're looking at what can we do in those areas and maybe connect some of them. Um, and, and again, some of this is geared toward looking at other programs, designations. There's one called a neighborhood uh, development area that we've been considering for about a year and a half, two years, um, that some of these changes might help with that. Um, and that's gonna be over here at table three with Carrie and John. And then energy and Act 174, and that is gonna be in the back table with Cheryl, and, and I already covered a little bit about that, some of the, some of the uh, energy goals and uh, what the benefits are of really pursuing an enhanced energy plan. An, an enhanced energy plan, thank you, is, is basically, uh, you, you wanna hit that one, Cheryl? There are certain uh, state required um, elements to an enhanced plan. Um, it's a, quite the checklist uh, that you need to address things like there has to be uh, certain maps in your plan, there has to be calculations and you have to estimate your current energy needs, how you can help move toward future energy needs. So they're very specific uh, format 
for that plan, and then that needs to be uh, adopted, um, approved at the regional level. Um, and now that our regional plan has just been adopted, now is in the process of being adopted, they will be able to say, um, put their stamp of approval on our plan. And so it's, it's, a, it's a structure that has to address many, many things. I, I guess that's why it's enhanced. It's just way longer. <laughs> Yes. Expand on that a little bit. Uh, up until before this, towns or would have due consideration in these proceedings, and if you have an enhanced plan, you go up a level to substantial deference. So that's one of the big drawing cards and going into these enhanced approved plans, either by towns or regional planning committees. Just one of the add that uh, part of it uh, because that's important for when towns uh, go in uh, before the Public Utilities Commission uh, within these projects. And, and Mike actually just whispered in my ear, gave me a good, uh, a good piece of advice. Um, where we are in the process right now, our plan is set to expire in about a year. So we're really just at the beginning of rewriting this plan. So the reason that we were holding this event tonight is to be able to get your input, your feedback early in the process so that it can really guide what we're doing with the plan. Um, so that's what this is all about. And so now, without further ado, uh, be, um, oh, oh, hold on, we have another question. Kevin? Yeah. Are the changes that you guys propose for the high density district, are those to meet the NDA requirements? Uh, yeah, that, that's, that's a big part of it. It's not the only thing that we're doing for it, but you know, that was kind of the starting point for us, was looking at it and realizing that our application for the NDA would have been dead on arrival, and what would we need to do to do that? Um, but we also felt very strongly that we as a board didn't want to make that decision solely on our own. We wanted some input on that, so yes. Uh, the NDA is the, the Neighborhood Development Area, um, which, is, which is a state program that basically if, if you have that, there are some advantages. Um, a developer will be able to have reduced or completely gone uh, Act 250 costs associated with it. Um, there are also some sewage hookup costs that are, are mitigated. Um, and, and, you know, there, there are some other good things for the community that come out of having that program. Um, so now, you know, we have oh, another question. I just would like some clarification on number three. You said a half mile area of walking. Um, don't want to restrict uh, our uh, possibilities of bringing other people into the community. Uh, just to visit the place instead of just, uh, you know, living here. Yeah, that, that half mile radius um, is, is really, you know, that's not precluding further out walking in. I mean, I live further out than, than that half mile and I walk here all the time. Uh, it, it's more that for that program, for example, for the, the neighborhood development area program, they want to see certain kinds of densities within that area. Um, so that, that's where that point comes in. Yes, June. June Sargent, I own property down on McDonough Drive. My question to the group is, where is infrastructure addressed in the municipal development plan? And if it's not addressed, how is it gonna be tied to some of the previous plans that have been done, like the downtown basin recommendations that have yet to be addressed? Can you clarify what you mean by infrastructure? Sewer and water lines, okay. 
<laughs> and collapsing roads. Um, the, the plan has, you know, does cover all of that in, in terms of, you know, our transportation section. There are pieces and parts where, uh, where we're talking about the roads, where we're talking about um, the sidewalks. There just this spring, actually it was more fell into June, uh, finished a, um, an inventory of the sewer system in, in the town, in the city and um, parts of that are going to make it into the next iteration of the plan, so absolutely there, there are things there. Um, there's gonna be some time for general questions after the breakout sessions. Um, what I'd like to do is have people go to the sections that they'd like to, to uh, really know more about um, and, and start having some, some round table discussions and um, if, if you're interested in more than one, uh, obviously you can get up and walk around, enjoy pizza, there's coffee, there's cookies. Um, and then, you know, after about a half an hour or so, we'll, we'll come back and reconvene and answer some more questions. Thank you. Okay, we'll start doing a recap of, of the different conversations. I've kind of flitted around to all of them, it sounded like some real good things were happening. Um, before I do that though, I'm gonna turn the mic over to Christine just for a second, because she's got some important housekeeping announcements for everybody. Important housekeeping, that's never. Uh, I just wanna make a note that the, there's a index card with your agenda, and that's there for folks if you feel like um, you didn't get a chance to ask your question, um, or you just wanna make sure we really know it. Uh, I know in the group I was with, I didn't, I couldn't capture everything. I couldn't actually hear people, and you might, others might have had that problem. So if you want to write down your comment, there's pencils uh, on the welcome table if you need it, and a basket back there, and so that we, or you, of course, can email. <laughs> but if you want it tonight, and if there's anything right now, well, we're going to have the Q&A session, but if anyone um, isn't is shy, I don't think this is really a shy group, but <laughs> uh, then you can write it down and... Um, put in the basket and we'll answer it before we leave tonight, so that's it. And, and you can always email us at virgensplan at gmail.com and we'll, you know, the entire planning commission will be reviewing those emails and discussing them. Uh, we've already gotten a half dozen or so from folks, so thank you. And now we're gonna turn it over to table one, which is Tim and Donnell. I didn't even know I was doing this until a few minutes before it started. Well, this, I don't need that. I need. Well, do you want to give, okay, why don't you give the overview again? Okay. And then I'll go into that. Uh, so for context on this discussion, we were talking about the high density residential zones in our town, which is this er orange area here and this orange area down here. And the, um, the short answer is that we are proposing smaller lot sizes and setbacks to make it a little easier for people to build much needed housing there. Okay, you'll take this and I'll do the first okay. <laughs> And as was touched upon before, we, ta we talked about the uh, neighborhood, the NDA, the neighborhood designated, why am I forgetting it now? Neighborhood designated area. And again, a lot of this conversation, it, came about is because we're physically not able to meet the state standards to actually get one of these designations to therefore help with some of these development costs. So that's why, again, the minimum lot size is a, question, is a, is a point of concern. Um, from here, though, of course, we had a lot of great, great input and questions that, and I did my best to capture some of the kind of comments that were made. Um, one of the first initial comments, uh, questions that was posed was, of course, you know, obviously, Infrastructure would be a really important part of this uh, puzzle as well. Um, roads, sewer, you know, um, wastewater, as we talked about. Um, we did touch upon that in another way as well. And also, because we also brought up the fact that it's not just level land. The topography of this area is very interesting. Um, there are some wetlands in there. There's, I'd call a ravine of sorts. So it's not that this is gonna get flat developed and just kind of bulldoze and just, you know, tiny houses and tiny houses. So those things do have to keep, be kept into consideration when we're just looking at that flat map. Um, and with that, there would be still available areas for green space, et cetera, and there are very much limitations as to what could happen in those areas. Hmm. Um, moving on just again with some of these 
items here. Of course, the question of does this become just single family housing, or are we talking about multifamilies, et cetera? And all of those are touched upon as far as individual items within this zone. But also, what about high, high rises? What if we go into multi-level apartment complexes or something along those lines? The one question that um, was posed towards the end, and John, you'll soon be tasked with this project, is <laughs> being our, our numbers guru. But again, what is the maximum density that, well, how many people, what is the maximum density that can happen in that area at this time? And with these proposals, what else, what did, what would be that maximum number? So current standards, and then with the changed proposal, you know, the ideas as well that are going around. Um, obviously that takes a few other pieces of consideration as far as the, enter, the overlays, et cetera. So just some math, because I think that was a great point that we weren't able to answer just right off the top of our heads. Um, it came up again, do we need more housing or do we not? Of course, that's a question that has a lot of different perspectives. Um, how does this also affect our current property owners? Um, will things increase? Will, will cost increase? Will cost increase because of this needed infrastructure? Or will they decrease because we're adding more housing and therefore would be increasing the grand list, which would ideally benefit all in the grand scheme of it as far as taxpayers go? Um, <laughs> what else is? Um, Yep, so we talked a lot about make the differentiation between low income housing versus affordable housing or also being known as workforce housing. Um, you know, again, when we talk about these maybe multi-level units, what, is, what are the parameters of that? Who is developing that? And that's, a, and that's still a piece for conversation, but we definitely need workforce housing um, is something that we talked about. And again, if we increase the supply, um, if we, if, if we increase the supply, ideally, um, maybe rental costs would go down across the board. So again, how does that work for people that have been owning multifamilies over the years? Um, speaking of existing infrastructure, someone also pointed out that the younger generation coming in don't necessarily want our old inventory. They want newer, they want shinier, they want you know things that are, have those characteristics but also walkable to downtown. So those are some other areas that we touched upon. Uh, what else we got here? Um, Dave, Austin, I do need to touch base with you. You mentioned maybe pulling in Middlebury College again um, and talking about some studies. I missed the first part, but again, you also noted about implications to Route 7 and how that may impact. <laughs> um, one thing that was touched upon um, is in regards to obviously we have our stormwater overflow issues. Um, truly that two different, co two different conversations um, as increasing, you know, we do have sewer capacity, and of course increasing, adding more houses, how does that affect what we're currently exist going through? But again, as Rennie touched upon, they are still two different issues. Uh, we have the sewer capacity, but right now we have wastewater, not wait, stormwater issues, correct? Thank you. And, da, 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 da. oh, and then we also kind of ended up touching upon things that were talked about in the other sessions as well, such as connectivity, the, the possible rail trail that we all talk about and really making it a full walkable area. Um, and, whoop, no idea why that happened. And anything else? I think that's about covered. Did I, I covered it? Okay. And of course, there was a lot of conversation, lots of pieces of the conversation that maybe we weren't able to touch upon. I didn't capture everything. So if there is something that was really integral to that conversation, please write it down on that comment card. Could be completely anonymous, um, but everything will be considered as we continue this process. You can also send us uh, emails at what was that, Virgin's plan at gmail.com. Uh, anything specific about this, you know, it doesn't have to be, you don't have to get the postcard tonight. We'll still be taking comments from you guys for uh, quite a while. Was there anybody in favor of more housing for Gavin? Not necessarily. <laughs> uh, Bob was asking if everyone is in favor of more housing, and the answer is no, not everyone's in more favor of housing at our table. There was definitely a, um, more conversation that could be had in regards to that area. So should we go into mics, I guess, yeah. from there? Yep. So we were at the, dealing with the agricultural district. The agri agricultural district is this dark green area to the south of town and the dark green area to the north of town. Um, 
there is no working farm in the south end of the town, though some of the land is hayed and used for farms, but the farms aren't actually there. In the north end, there's Comfort Hill Kennels, where the quote was, there's a lot of things going on that people don't realize about, um, and also some of that land is hayed. The current zoning for this area is one house per five acres, and that's about all that can be done with it. And the idea from the Planning Commission is that perhaps we could allow a higher density housing on there, such as there is with the low density residential, which is uh, one unit per two acres with planned unit developments, would allow higher density development, would allow um, a developer to come in with some infrastructure. Because right now, if it's just one house per five acres, then the infrastructure demands all fall on the developer, so it's not very realistic. Uh, I would say our group did not reach consensus on this. Uh, there was definitely an understanding that there's a need for higher end housing to supply workers at UTC who are currently living in Shelburne and commuting uh, and, and others as well. There's a demand for housing. But there were others that were saying that we should maintain these rural areas uh, the, and, and pretend, perhaps look to them as recreational opportunities. And my response was to that was that you can't have public purchase of those lands and recreational opportunities without a larger grand list which would require the housing that might go on those areas. So this is an area, that, um, the other piece from the Planning Commission's perspective is that the idea is Virgin should be the most densely developed part of northern Addison County and so by creating more housing you're taking pressure off of existing farm fields in Ferrisburg, Waltham, Panton, New Haven. Um, it, and again, that wasn't universally accepted at, at the group there, that there's still the demand that we want to maintain some of these open spaces. So it's an area that requires more conversation, and I look forward to hearing comments from both people who were at the table and who weren't able to attend this to let the Planning Commission know your thoughts on that as we move forward. Hi. Um, so I'm uh, speaking about the accessibility and connectivity area. Um, thanks everybody for, uh, in, in that group, well thank you all for coming, but thank you particularly to this group for asking such good questions and making good suggestions. Um, what we were doing in our group was really just trying to get a sense of priority. How interested are people in these um, issues of accessibility and connectivity? So I came away with um, some sense of priorities and I'm looking at John because he's going to fill in the, the details that I forget to mention. Um, but certainly at our table, uh, people were very interested in prioritizing the sidewalks that we have. Um, some streets in particular were mentioned, Main Street, McDonough Drive, South Water Street, Moncton Road. Um, there are safety concerns for pedestrians, um, accessibility issues for people in wheelchairs, um, uh, an interest in connecting the downtown with the basin area for boaters. All of this is related to sidewalks that we currently have. Um, but somebody reminded us that we must think about the infrastructure that, that lies below the sidewalks. Um, so um, before we go repaving or resurfacing uh, sidewalks, we want to make sure that the sewer, the water, and the stormwater runoff issues are addressed. So prioritizing sidewalks that we have was definitely an interest at our table. Um, then um, we are very motivated to make the city more friendly to walkers and bikers. Um, we recognize the possibility that mm, such um, prioritization presents for attracting cycling companies that are already coming in. Perhaps they would come in more. They do tell us that um, certain parts of the city feel unsafe or could feel more safe. Um, um, but we are reminded that improving um, cycling and um, pedestrian access is not just for tourists. Um, it would improve the livability of the city for current residents and for future residents as well. Um, I, I love the idea, or maybe I shouldn't, but I do love the idea of competing with other towns in Addison County. It was pointed out that we have a strong, stronger potential in this city um, than some of our surrounding towns just because of, of our landscape and our topography. Um, I have to sit down so that I can turn the page. <laughs> uh, there was also um, some interest in um, improving our connections to the basin area from the downtown. I mentioned that in the context of sidewalks, but specifically this came up um, when we were talking about the bridge 
the bridge at the bottom of the hill. Um, people are fearful for their lives sometimes when they cross that bridge, even on foot. Um, and somebody held up the Crown Point Bridge as an example. So newer bridges have better, um, uh, well, better accessibility for pedestrians, and Crown Point Bridge is an example of that. So something for us to keep in mind. Um, and then finally, uh, a reminder. <laughs> We have some nice recreation areas already. We need to make sure that those are maintained um, so they get overgrown. Um, so a suggestion to come up with a maintenance plan for existing recreation areas, uh, maybe even an adopt-a-trail program. What did I miss? Great. All right. Thank you, everybody. So at the energy table, we discussed how can we encourage our community to um, get to 90% renewable by 2050. Um, that's a tall order when, of course, there isn't a lot of funding for such a, such a feat. Um, we talked about the enhanced plan that the state is encouraging, and there doesn't seem to be a downside um, from anybody's opinion as to going for the enhanced uh, energy plan that Addison County Regional can help us with because that will put the control in in, um, in Virgins as to where we want to site uh, different renewable so, uh, solar arrays and things like that. So that's um, that seems like a no-brainer, um, but how to take advantage of grants is what we discussed. Um, one of the grants that is available right now is for charging stations. So we talked a bit about uh, charging stations, and one of the things that we have to uh, consider for the grant uh, application is specific sites. So we discussed where in Regens there would, would be good locations for charging stations for electric cars. Uh, so we talked about that. Another way, another suggestion for reducing our fossil fuel consumption in town as far as transportation goes is to maybe look into shuttle and buses around Virgins, maybe more actor kind of routes, um, maybe some free shuttle so people can get around Virgins without uh, using their cars. Maybe the shuttles would be solar powered. Um, so that kind of talk, that we, then we started talking about solar options in town and one of the um, constraints uh, when we talk about solar is the transmission lines. And so we talked a bit about the red lines that we have all around Virgins, well, all of Addison County. Um, currently, individual homes are always totally accepted to, to go ahead and put uh, photovoltaic cells on the roof. But when it comes to uh, an array, especially when you're looking at 150, um, those projects aren't looked at as favorably because of the, the load on the transmission lines right now. So we'd like to work with GMP and see if we can uh, kind of make some, some uh, improvements on that. One of the things we can do is talk to GMP about uh, how they've worked with the town of Panton uh, providing uh, battery storage might be a way to get around the transmission line. So we'd like to encourage some communication with Green Mountain Power about that. Um, construction, as far as uh, uh, um, new buildings, the, the insulation, uh, the building codes that are, are in place for new buildings are great. We're going to encourage uh, new building construction to exceed those codes if possible. Um, and wherever there is an opportunity with older housing to add insulation or to add something that will um, button up their home, we're going to try to encourage that. So we'll be looking for uh, funding wherever, wherever that's possible. That seems to be the way to go. So one of the things we want to do is include these things in our plan because as those uh, grants become available, if we've already addressed it in our plan, then we're, we're halfway there to being eligible for grants when they come up. So that's really the idea is to put these things into our plan that we may be eligible for someday down, down the road as those things come up. Um, so if there are any future energy needs you can think of, any way that we can help us all as a community get to that goal, you know, certainly drop us a line. I think that's it. Thank you. Now the important stuff. 
Um, be before we go much further, hey, Brent. Um, Brent Murkowski is our um, delegate for the city of Urgenz on the Transportation Advisory Committee. Uh, where is the bridge on the regional list? It was listed number one last year on the priority list. Um, it was uh, then uh, placed or downgraded to second uh, because of the Route 17 bridge. Uh, that, that actually stepped up in priority. So we, is, as of, I guess, this year, we would presumably be back up to number one again. So. Do you know where, where that puts us in relation to the rest of the state? Um, I do not in, in terms of that time frame now. My, my question was where that puts us in terms of the rest of the state, and we don't know that. But at least for the county, that's the number one bridge to be replaced. Um, I guess now we will just talk about if you have any questions. Uh, but before we do the questions, where we go next. So we're going to take all of this information that we, we got tonight and as we're going to continue to get from your comments, and we're going to sit down as a group, and we're going to kind of review everything and figure out, okay, where, where do we go from here? Where does this fit in our plan? Um, as we're rewriting things, we take all of this into consideration. All of these comments inform what we're going to do. Um, this is not the last time that you have in any input. Um, you know, it's an ongoing process that's going to last for about the next year. Um, if you suddenly think of something in January and you say, ah, I wanted to tell them that, come to one of our meetings. We meet on the first Monday of, of the month, 7 o'clock downstairs. Send us an email, write us a letter, give me a call, whatever. Uh, we do want to hear from you. And then I guess the last thing is, um, before you go, make sure you grab more pizza if you want. Um, if there are questions that people have now, I'm going to turn the mic over to Peter so he can come out with the mic to hear your question. No questions? First taker? Oh, come on. I've, wow. been, look I've been looking forward to running around all night long. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we have a question. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm wondering, I, I didn't hear anything tonight about technology services or technology infrastructure, and I noticed you have a Gmail account. Just want to bring that up. You know, is there any plan, <laughs> is this part of the plan, or uh, you know, uh, what's the goal here as far as including things that aren't included? Um, that, that's, a, that's an excellent question, and actually one of the Planning Commission members asked me almost the identical question before everything started. Um, you know, I was asked, hey, what about internet service providers? My ISP is horrible. What can we do? Um, you know, we can put language in our plan about it. We don't necessarily have a lot of teeth to do much about it. Um, but certainly, that is something that, hearing that comment, and, and if we get others, you know, we're going to take a look at that and say, what is our longer term vision for that? So thank you. I, I, I don't know if that answers the question. And we would invite any help you might want to provide in crafting language. <laughs> yes. Just a follow up. You know, I think about this Vermont gas big dig that's going in. I think about it in Virgins like that, and uh, it's tearing up all the streets. But there might have been an opportunity there if we had in the plan to put some conduit in for fiber so that we could have a better home to, you know, the last mile is really the problem, and I still see it in Virgins. I agree with you. You know, the, the logistics of getting everybody lined up, you know, as far as providers at the same time to go into the same hole would be really tough, but aspirationally, I love that idea. All right, if I stand to the front just so everyone can see me, yeah. that way, a little less awkward. Yeah, yeah sure. <laughs> nice to meet you. Nice to meet you all. I'm Rainwalker. Uh, I was born in Denver, Colorado in 1981. Uh, how many other people are under 40 here? Anybody else? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, 
Sure. If, if I could just make one point, it would be to tell you a little bit about what it was like to grow up in the sprawl of um, what's called Centennial, Colorado. Centennial it was prairie uh, in 1971. There was a neighborhood that was started probably around then, 1970. Uh, this was 13 miles south of Denver, so this is the same distance as between either Middlebury and us, or I guess, I don't know, Charlotte or something like that. Uh, so. Okay, so Bristol's 13 miles away from here. Okay, so Denver, Colorado, where the Broncos and the Avalanche and the Rockies and all those professional sports teams was 13 miles away from where I was living. And actually, where I was living, though, there was better uh, access to nature uh, than I have renting a cheap room here. And so the, I think the reason is because this was farmland, and I'm not sure about the strategic growth. You actually know these things. I'm just going to speculate by telling you about what I lived through. Uh, I lived in a a one square mile development. And sorry, how many square miles is Virgin's again? 1.4. 1.4. So in exactly the same area. Oh, sure. I'm scared of this thing. It's going to really amplify my deep growl. <laughs> Hello. OK, um, so yeah, within one square mile, so just a, a tiny uh, speck smaller than Virgin's, uh, we had an open space because there was a floodplain with a giant dam. And that dam was uninhabitable, and it was much of that space was, in, was within the 100-year um, flood uh, water level. And so what we did with it was actually put uh, gravel pathways, and that was uh, planned in from the very beginning. And there were also green belts. Okay, so this was one of the advantages of these kind of awful-looking sprawl, you know, housing square miles because. Uh, I was almost always within 100 yards of either a green belt where you could go and lie down as long as you looked after the dog poop, <laughs> right? Or, or within the, uh, a pathway, a gravel pathway, which was easy to run or mountain bike on or walk a dog on um, through that open space. Okay, so if uh, from the perspective of making quality of life uh, better, my experience from living in Centennial, Colorado is to recommend to you all that somehow we create enough buy-in, um, if necessary, from you know, having current landowners seed a part of their land, create enough buy-in to have a shared trail or green belt or natural access pathway. It's completely worth it. And just like this interesting point about the fiber optics is just very visionary, uh, that's actually very visionary for everything to do with quality of life and health, by the way. Um, and just so I don't talk everything, that's all I'll say today, because it was worth it. Amen, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Oh. I'm wondering where um, uh, trees and greenery fit into. Um, d is that any part of the plan? Or I know we have a town arborist. Um, uh, <laughs> that's our, our current town manager. I think that's part of his responsibilities. I see some trees on streets go down, but trees, new trees aren't planted. Um, I love the wonderful new um, flashing lights to, uh, for walkways. And when the one was being put in in the north of town, I was so excited thinking, oh my gosh, they're going to be planting those wonderful bed of flowers and greenery at the base of those. And it will be you know, another welcome into Virgins. But unfortunately, the base was um, paved over with um, uh, macadam. So it just, I, I feel like the literal greenness is a, a, it's a, a part that should be part of what we're planning and ensuring that we keep as much green stuff growing in our town as possible. I'll just add that our next door neighbor lost a beautiful, beautiful tree uh, that the town cut down and there was absolutely no notice given. She literally went to work and came home and found the tree in front of her house gone. So that seems a little short-sighted. So about three or four years ago, maybe longer, I guess, we did rewrite the tree plan for the city, and we got UVM Extension to come in and help us out with that. And we can take a look at, definitely take a look at including that right into the plan. But there is an existing document, and we'll make sure the new city manager is aware of it. Uh, who, who owns the agricultural... There's one, one in the north of the city and one in the south of the city. I'm assuming those are privately owned pieces of land. 
The green, the dark green? Yep. Um, down here, these are privately owned. Yeah. Uh, this big section is mostly owned by the state. Uh huh. Um, and this is privately owned. And and none of it's or some of it's used for haying, and some people are still using some of it for farming. Are you, uh, different types of uh, products, I assume. Barns on any of that property. The, yeah. the Comfort Hill Kennel, Kennel has. There is a barn. Okay, with with cow barn. Okay, so there is some active use of it. There's haying. Um, lands I presume are rented out to other farmers around as well. Okay, so, so I'm a, I'm not quite understanding how that comes into play for the city if the city doesn't have anything, doesn't own that land or what? The city zones it. Okay. So right now, the zoning only allows one unit per every five acres. Oh, so if the individuals wanted to sell off some of yeah, that. The yeah, the city's yeah. not actually planning a development or anything like gotcha. that. It would just be allowing more uses. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Has, eminent dom has eminent domain ever come into uh, to figure with uh, the zoning here at all? Not in the city of Virgins, as far as I have ever heard, no. Okay, with that, um, I think we will draw names from the hat for the raffle prizes. Yeah, and... and Shaxbury Cider Rosé. Thank you, Shaxbury Cider. 416003. Next is... Shaxbury Dry, 416020. <laughs> <laughs> uh, $25 gift card, three squares. Thank you, three squares. Four one six zero zero eight. Another three squares. Four one six zero one four. Daily chocolate. Four one six zero one one. So I want to thank, of course, the Virgenza Opera House for letting us have this event here. Three Squares, who provided some gift cards as well as uh, desserts and coffee. Uh, hired Hand for the pizzas, Shaxbury Cider, Daily Chocolate, uh, and of course, everybody that came. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening. Wait, hold on. One. Uh, he wants to do it again. Uh, okay, we're, we're going to re-raffle. Thank you, Rennie. 416004. Thank you and have a wonderful evening.